Good evening and welcome to ACME. <laughs> My name is Ari, I'm a producer for public programs here. Before we begin, I'd like to uh, acknowledge that we meet today on the lands of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. I'd like to pay my respects to the elders past, present and emerging, and to any First Nations people who might be in the audience today. Well, today we're extremely lucky to be talking with uh, Joan Ross and Dr. Josh Hall about their brand new VR work, Did You Ask the River? And I'd like to introduce our host for this evening, Senior Curator at ACME, Fiona Trigg. Thanks, Ari, and welcome every... Thank you. <laughs> welcome, everyone, and welcome to those people who are watching online. Um, as Ari said, we're lucky to have... Joan Ross and Josh Hall here with us tonight to talk about Did You Ask the River? Um, so I might just start with a little bit of an introduction for those of you who are not familiar with Joan and Josh and their work. Um, so Joan is a very established artist who works across the platforms of video, animation, print, sculpture and installation. And Joan's work investigates globalisation and colon colonisation with a particular focus on reconfiguring the colonial Australian landscape and drawing attention to the complex and ongoing issues surrounding first contact. And we'll talk about those issues as we go through the talk tonight. Um, she's exhibited widely in Australia and internationally, and her work is held in many major um, collections around the country. Um, I won't go through all of your awards, because you have a website that people can look up your CV if they like. Um, but you did uh, spend some time in Scotland in 2016, so we might reference that a little bit later on. Um, and Josh, Dr. Josh Hall, is a multidisciplinary researcher and a new media artist. New media, that's an interesting term that we can maybe talk about a little bit later. Um, with a background in computer science, philosophy and fine arts. His research investigates the virtual spaces generated by emerging technologies, our encounters with the world through them and their social and political impacts. That's a really interesting way of describing your practice, Josh, because you're not a VR specialist per se, are you? Like you come to VR from a background of a whole lot of other technologies. Yeah. Yep. We'll talk Absolutely. about that more when we get um, into the work itself. Um, I thought we might look at some of, oh, we've got the slide up already. So we might just start by talking about some of Joan's more recent work, um, just to kind of set the scene for those of you who are not familiar with her practice. Um, so this is the work that was the winner of the John Sulman Prize in 2017. Um, would you like to talk a little bit about this work, Joan? Uh, so obviously I've used my um, fluoro... Yes. I'm not sure what to... Say. Well, well, you often use <laughs> fluoro colours as a kind of marker of colonial presence. Yep. Um, I might just jump forward just because if you look at the fellow on the left there and then you look at this painting by Thomas Gainsborough, you'll mm. see that there's a kind of a, a borrowing of that figure, this mm. very sort of traditional landscape with people who own the land standing proudly in front of I've it. I've used this guy quite a lot of times. I call yeah. him the butterfly catcher oh, yeah. or the butterfly murderer. Yeah. Oh. Um, I made a video called Touching Other People's Butterflies. Right. And... He was the, the main, um, there was a, a woman and a man, he was the main figure. So a, a very beautiful butterfly, which actually was a moth. And that's also part of uh, talking about how history is, is not always the truth. Right. Um, not many people have picked that up so far, but that right. was the reason for it. But when he comes in and uh, when, when he sees the beautiful butterfly flying around, he doesn't think twice, he kicks a tree out of the way and he just snaps up the butterfly in his net. Right. Uh, so I'm I, I'm critical of collecting, right? And I see that this image, when I did a little bit of research, is also based on a drawing of a museum that was in existence in London that held a vast collection of material that had been collected by the First Fleet scientists. Yeah, so I put him into the Laverian Museum, right? And you know, made the the hallway sort of go into infinity. Um, because I think, you know, again, as I said, I'm critical of the collecting mentality and what it means to, uh, in regards to the feeling of superiority from the colonials. Yeah. yeah. That kind of idea that you can own, label, categorise another mm. culture's kind of artefacts or 
um, key kind of emblems. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's it's interesting. Uh, I got in a taxi the other day and someone asked what I did and, and I, t I told the man that, you know, my work is about colonisation and about the legacies around um, Indigenous people. And he said, oh, you know, here's a migrant. He said, what's the problem? He said, we gave them back their land, didn't we? Right. And so those are the types of reasons that I stay critical. Right. Um, I did ask him what he meant and right. he couldn't really explain it. Right. Mm. Um, those themes are common to your practice, so um, this is another work of kind of appropriating. So you kind of don't work with direct historical records but with imagery created by people who were from history. Mm. You, you're, you kind of trade in art history images more than in source documents. Is that a fair way of looking at your relationship to history or...? Or not? I don't know what you mean the difference between source documents is. Well, you um, you often work with reappropriating or changing or adapting imagery that's been created by artists from the past. Yes, no, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Uh, and in this series, I've actually um, I've gone in and had a look at all the, the type of text that they have and the language they use around... Uh, the flora and fauna when they first arrived in right. Australia, which right. is what we're looking at here, yeah. um, and, and shifted. I mean, one of them, uh, the top of it says, uh, a native bird. Right. You know, and that's also looking at language, you know, the way we say things like, oh, I'm going to get some natives right. from, yeah. the, from the nursery. Yeah. And I don't think people actually hear what they're saying when they do that. Right. This bird is called Future, future Hawk, and it's pretty much about, um, you know, what's happening in the world at the moment environmentally in terms of, uh, you know, what could happen to birds. They, they would become extinct and yeah. they are becoming extinct every day. Yeah, yeah. Um, stock take sale, now on. So, uh, look, I'm critical of a lot of things. Uh, <laughs> clearly. Uh, and, and one of them is, you know, consumerism and globalisation and over-shopping and the destruction of the planet. And, of course, you know, it comes back to the title of, of the VR work, Did You Ask the River? Is There a Negotiation with Nature? Right. Um, I don't think anyone's got the right to sell plants and animals on, on one type of level, you know. Uh, so this was... And I'm also... Uh, dead against sky riding because I very much love and, uh, nature and I, and I really love the sky and, and, you know, everything's been used and I, I just hate the idea that people are starting, you know, I'm going to put advertising in the sky and we're not going to get any space whatsoever. Right. Um, yeah. This is a still from a video that I made. Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, and this is also a still from a video, a video animation the claiming of things. And this work in particular is quite relevant for Did You Ask the River, isn't it? Do you want to describe a little bit about some of the things that happen in this animation? Well, you've, you've come straight in on the graffiti uh, here and, and, and of course it's, it's about a, a lack of respect. Uh, these, these colonials, they don't know this could be um, a sacred site, this could be... Uh, anything and and in fact it is a beautiful rock uh, and they don't know but the graffiti itself starts with banks the money banks joseph banks then it goes into banksy mm. Mm. the graffiti artist and then it goes into banksia mm. the naming of things so mm. this is from the video the claiming of things and this is called the naming of things mm. and and another obsession is the way that in australia uh, a lot of things are named after explorers and there's not a lot of thought gone into that in terms of um, what was here before. Yeah. So and I guess the use of the graffiti is just a really clear way of saying that this practice still continues. It's not something that's stopped. Um, well, it's true, but the graffiti is tagging. So it's about tagging your space. Right. About making it your own. Right. Yeah. And yeah. naming landscape yeah. is a big part of it. And that. also the fence is part of yeah. the same thing. It's like, yeah, this yeah. is mine yeah. now. Yeah. And what's the um, painting that that's based on? Is that a kind of collage of different Glover paintings, or is uh, there it's a, this is one it is uh, more specifically from the Bath of Diana by John oh, Glover. Okay, yeah, uh, it's one of my favourites of his. 
and uh, yeah, I just changed it around a bit to, uh, <laughs> and played with it. <laughs> Um, and I think that video is available for people to see if they search on the internet. Yeah, if you go to my website, you can you can see the claiming of things. Yeah, yeah. Great. Um, and you've also worked in installation and sculpture. Here, this colour, I don't know, it's very, maybe not quite the best colour rendering. Um, but do you want to talk a little bit about this installation? Well, this work one? was... Um, a, a, a um, GBK gallery, the entire gallery um, made into a lounge room um, and then a back room. Um, it was called uh, Enter at Your Own Risk and everyone who came into the show had to wear a fluoro jacket. Ah. So the more that more fluoro there is, the less you can see. Right. And, I mean, I first started using fluoro... Uh, when I first started to notice, just after 9-11, I started to notice it was affecting my aesthetic and I didn't understand why it was there and I didn't like it. Right. Um, and then I realised because insurance premiums had gone up that people were being forced to, to, um, forced to sign um, agreements with their work to wear it because they didn't want, the works didn't want to be sued and the whole thing was going... Like that, but I also realised that the colour was it's a very powerful colour. You can disappear in it. So I've done works where um, called Last Scene, Leaving the Scene of the Crime, wearing a high vis jacket and pants. It's a working class colour. It holds a lot of authority and fear with it. Yeah. Um, but also, when there's too much of it, um, you can't see it. I had another exhibition using this fluoro called I Don't Think I Can See You Anymore. Right. And I think we have one more work from that show, a little figurine with a kind of airbag head. Yeah, look, yeah. I've sort of got a... Uh, I detest these statues. <laughs> 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 and everything associated with them. Yeah. <laughs> As made quite clear by that yeah. <laughs> He's holding it like a dead chicken, yeah. a dead fluoro chicken. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, sorry, and just... We'll just go back to this because this is a particularly kind of witty sculpture. Take, take, take. A supersized, ironically luxurious ladies' handbag after Louis Vuitton. Kangaroo skins, gilt metal and glazed ceramic. So was that part of that same exhibition or a, a different show that this work? No, that was, was a different show. Um, it's called... It was called um, I Made This For You. Right. So a lot of my titles are double... Uh, uh, double-sided, like yeah. um, Oh, History, You Lied to Me, yeah. was about history lying, but also about a person lying to me. Right. Um, uh, yeah, they're everything, uh, quite a lot of the things in my work have another, a little bit of an emotional meaning because I'm a fairly uh, emotionally intense sort of person and mm -hmm. my uh, feelings always will come into whatever I do. Yeah. Uh, and sometimes I sneak them in there. I do, I do secretive um, things that just I enjoy. <laughs> Uh, but this um, this bag on the other side, the label "Take Take Take," is is very large because it's quite important when it works in kangaroo fur for, uh, and it's embellished as it is for people not to take take it the wrong way to to for them to think that it's a serious, beautiful handbag. People actually did say to me, "You should start your own label," um, and it's exactly the opposite intention. And because, again, it's around consumerism and um, the using of, of people and... Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's really amazing. How large is that? In, it's about, oh, it's wow. about that big. Wow. And then the hand, handle is a chain and it's... Right, that. right. It's huge. Yeah, yeah. Hmm. Um, so we might just turn to Josh. This is just a clip from Amina picture of Josh's website so if anyone's interested to find out more about his work I just thought I'd put the spelling of your name up there and Tactical Space Lab which is your kind of working place. Do you want to tell us a little bit about Tactical Space Lab and what you do through there? Yeah sure so Tactical Space Lab the idea of it is to um, look critically at the intersection of technology and art really um, and it came out it really the impetus to to put effort into it and and have it as a thing in itself 
came from um, being overseas on residency and coming back to Sydney around about the time augmented reality and VR was really taking off. Right. And um, Sydney had a massive AR, VR meetup scene. Like th at one point it was the most highly attended in the world, including you know, New York and, right. and um, San Francisco and things like that. <laughs> For whatever reason, there are hundreds of people attending these events. And I went to a few of them and it was just fl filled with people who really wanted to um, to get venture capital for their startups. Right. So everyone was, you know, there were a few things that were going on. People were talking about it as if it was completely, completely new without any way of being informed by something that had come previously. Mm -hmm. um, and also people, there was no criticality in how people were talking about using them. So these, you know, d disruptive VR, AR sort of technologies that were going to make basically... Um, obsolete skilled mechanics and things so in one example someone's like the problem is there's not enough skilled mechanics so we'll make a tool so that you don't need school skilled mechanics you just go and scan it and it gives you like step-by-step -step IKEA instructions right. Right. whereas like alternatively you could use the same technology for training people to be skilled mechanics so there was right. all this sort of language and everyone drinking yeah. the Kool-Aid um, and I really wanted to be to give something, some little oasis in Sydney of people talking informally about the technology, but also from a critical perspective. Right. Um, yeah. Um, and so your background on a technical level is as working in coding and. It's mixed. Yeah, I studied computer science and cybernetics at Reading at the time. Right. Reading was the, the preeminent um, robotics university in the UK. Right. Um, lots of people doing really exciting things with computer vision and robotics and things like that. And that computer vision, that was a long time ago now. That was like nearly, uh, yeah, showing my age, nearly uh, nearly 20 years ago. Yeah. Um, and that sort of computer vision technology has gone into things like augmented reality. Yeah. Um, so it was exciting, lots of interesting So you've always been on. interested in the way people use these new technologies and... Uh, I, I was terrible yeah. when I was first into it. I was like massive, massive nerd, but without any sort of sense of the world beyond it. So it didn't occur to me um, in any way that there was a social consequence to using certain technologies. And right. thankfully, as I've grown older, I've become <laughs> a little bit better with that side of things. Yeah. yeah. Um, it is amazing um, working at working here at Acme where we specialise in moving image, how you can just see that pattern <coughs> repeating from the very beginning of moving image technology where every new wave of technology, there's this sense, oh, it's going to revolutionise the world and completely change the industry, but then it quickly just gets absorbed and becomes part of the kind of mainstream um, and the way people tell stories and things certainly change, you know, whether you go from TV to widescreen, you know, back to downloading, all of those are radical um, interventions in the way we see moving image but essentially people just want to tell stories or find information and you know um, each kind of new wave of technology has its own political kind of and commercial imperatives but they're often overestimated by people who are championing the new tech is that what you yeah found with I VR? mean screen world downstairs is amazing because you have the luxury of putting everything in a historical context mm -hmm. so taking a deep breath and mm -hmm. sort of charting a thread through mm -hmm. everything and that's exactly how people really ideally would think about VR going okay well here's this new technology where can you know if people looked at VR and thought about how to use it and also had an idea of like magic lantern or any of that sort of the last few decades or a hundred years or whatever of putting it in the context that would be yeah. absolutely incredible yeah 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 um there's always a drive to make things more immersive that word is completely overused <laughs> of course as we know but that kind of fantasy that you can completely cut out the real so-called real world and just kind of create a new vision for people um so um this work was made as part of the modern Commission for VR and Joan I understand that you had done a workshop with Josh prior to applying for this so you were already testing the waters a little bit around VR would you like to talk about why you um, wanted to do that original workshop into VR well I think what what happened was that uh, someone had a VR friend and they met me and they were so hyper hyper um, <laughs> 
<laughs> and they were saying, your work would look, you know, so great in VR. And, I, and it got me thinking, although I, he terrified me slightly around it. Um, and he was like, come to my studio and watch a shark try to eat your head. And, <laughs> you know, um, that sort of disturbed me. And it ended up me getting into a conversation with Josh one night about this. And he said, we'll come around and have a look. Uh, I went around and had a look and I'm a little, you know, I get a little seasick and when I first put the headset on, mm. I found it a, a little claustrophobic. Yeah. Um, and then he asked me whether I wanted to be involved in a, in a, a short workshop. And when we did the workshop, uh, it changed a little bit. The more you get into that headset, you know, the more you um, get used to it. But the thing about it again was that I had, um, I felt like I had an idea, which was, uh, it was a drowned valley, um, drone birds uh, were the only survivors. They were living in a birdhouse trying to learn how to be real birds by watching videos that I've taken of nature, oh, okay. uh, which I spent a lot of time doing. Right. And... When you say drone birds, you mean like AI birds or... They were robot birds. Robot birds, yeah. They were, well, they would, yeah, I call them drone birds because, you know, there's birds that are artificial birds. Right. So they're artificial birds. Right. And they were learning, trying to learn to be real birds. And, but in the making of it, we had other things going on in there. Birds were landing on your hand, but you could grow flowers, for example, really big. And I started to notice that people were going, you know, like, what What else, what else, what else can I do? You know, I started to get really, they were, and it was annoying me because I'm so used to having more quiet work that was, people were, would under, uh, seem to possibly understand the concept. And, uh, and that was what it was sort of based on. This, so I found it a little bit confusing. Um, but Josh and I had a, uh, had a, um, uh, a, a radio interview and during the interview I, uh, I got a light bulb moment mm -hmm. about possibly turning the VR back on itself conceptually. Um, and do you want to talk a little bit more about that light bulb moment? <laughs> uh, well I can uh, just say about the, the um, opening that we had when we were showing our work how everyone was just desperately trying to chase after the interactive elements. Right, yeah. Um, and I think that's very much at the moment the novelty of VR. Mm -hmm. You put people into it, and it's not something where the, you know there's a frantic element to people's engagement with it. Yep. And also, next everything that they that they bring with them to put, go into a VR comes from everything that they've seen of VR, on t whether it's experiences that they've had before of, of like games where you mm -hmm. shoot things or whatever, mm -hmm. or things that they've seen on TV. Mm -hmm. So their expectations of what you are supposed to do or what you can do in VR is coloured by that. Um, and I think for better or worse, I mean, definitely for telling us telling a sort of um, rich story, um, at the moment, the novelty of VR definitely gets in the way of trying to do, or it makes it, it causes obstacles that you have to deal with. Um, and I don't, yes, I can, I, I don't want to, because this is the, the um, <laughs> the key point. I don't want to give the key point away. Yeah, so, the, so you you thought that that was really interesting to use the ethics of interactivity. Well, someone yeah. in the radio interview asked a question. Yeah, and it just it just set me off. Like, right. Um, and I don't exactly remember the question. Right. But we got out of the we got outside, and we stood there talking for a, a three quarters of an hour. Because uh, I said, I've got this idea. Right. I just realised what we could do. And, and then I said, when is that Morton Commission due? <laughs> and he said, I think we've got 12 hours. <laughs> because we'd talked about it a couple of times and I said, I don't have any ideas because right. I don't like how greedy people are in the VR. Right. I think it's a gimmick. I don't know if it's art. Right. Um, but when I got this idea, I felt like it was a turning around of, uh, of the whole thing so that the actual greed that I was seeing, I wanted people to... Uh, to use it for people to, uh, yeah. To use that part of that's part of the experience is yeah. recognizing that in yourself as a user. Yeah. That the more you interact, the more damage you're actually doing to the landscape. And yeah, and also that's the you know colonial greed. I mean, a lot of my um, works are about that type of yeah. um, 
greed in one way or another. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we should just mention that the um, Morden is currently open for applications. So if anyone's interested to apply, they have till the 7th of April and all the details are on our Don't leave it till the last 12 hours. <laughs> <laughs> Although what it does bring me back to is that, again, I'm an artist, work conceptually, have a lot of ideas all the time. But even with the, with the application, there's not a hope in hell that would have gotten done if it hadn't been Josh and I doing the application together. Right, so you realised when you did the workshop that you were kind of had a good working relationship and you figured you could work on these ideas, ping-pulling them? Well, true, but I also and... mean that just in actually doing the application. Oh, OK. <laughs> <laughs> but that that <laughs> indicates a pretty good working relationship that you can quickly put something together that you were happy with as an, I know, as an artist. He's and... the one that can put it quickly together. <laughs> 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 I just had the idea. Yeah, yeah. So in that workshop, Josh, you worked with a number of artists just to talk them through the, the potential and show them the potential of what they could do? Or well, was that? So or were you trying to challenge people with that? Or I'd say it wasn't a one-way street. It wasn't right. just taking knowledge of the technology and sort of introducing the artists to it. One thing about the way that technology gets developed is it tends to be people who are brilliant and technically minded but pretty much exist in a monoculture. So people who develop certain technologies don't, you know, you could pretty much have the same um, same process of innovation being purely focusing on, on like social innovation without the technology and produce more good for the world than people producing a faster way of doing X, Y, Z, this disruptive way without having any idea of how it can be used differently. Mm -hmm. So I think one, I think it's a two-way street for the relationship between artists and new technology, emerging technology, in that it offers new tools and ways of of, um, of expression, of telling stories, of, of um, new aesthetics, like particular, very, very particular new ways of presenting and viewing um, the world. Um, and sometimes with obstacles around the way that people, exp the audience experiences it. But at the same time, it gives a new, like artists, the way that artists use technology is so different from how it's been designed to be used. Right. Um, and like, uh, yeah, I have a friend who uses uh, all sorts of like little um, immersive, uh, like, uh, little chips and servos and things like that and it, it's just throwing things together and it, it works and does things that w w this stuff was never designed to do so okay. all of the artists are bringing a different way of using the technology and a different way of sort of um, a different aesthetic around right. using the technology um, for that and this work did you ask the river as we can see on that picture when you put on the headset and you hold the two it's a vive pro that it's made for and you hold the two hand controllers, you are playing this woman. So it has a, it, it's built on a gaming engine, that's correct, isn't it, on Unity or? Yeah. It's so it has a little, for people who haven't had the opportunity to look at the work yet, it feels a little bit like a first person game experience. Is that something that you were interested in? No. No, you're not really, in, you don't have come from a gaming background like that no. wasn't? Yeah. I'm aware of games and, yeah. and I understand that, but I, I, my, I felt troubled by that because I don't really like the game aesthetic. Yeah. And so, I mean, at the moment, um, I think you can see this woman's hair. Yeah. Um, that's, not the, that's not what I would put in, a, in an anim video animation. I wouldn't right. put that clunky hair in there. Right. Um, so I had to compromise <laughs> <laughs> in a whole lot of yeah, ways yeah. Yeah. with my aesthetic, yeah. um, which I've come much more around to uh, than I thought I would. Um, but it also, yeah, there's a lot more control in, in that sort of a way. But I also think that, you know, what's happened with Josh and I is that even though Josh stayed, that I didn't do anything other than work in Photoshop and give him things that he needed, uh, I didn't learn anything directly, but I learned a lot because you can't do it unless you know what that virtual reality yeah. world is. Yeah. But it also, I felt like um, between the first workshop and doing this, I made a new video animation, and I think it completely blew open my view. Right, uh, right. Yeah. But a key decision you would have made fairly early on was that the user was going to embody this 
colonial figure who's mm. a figure that's appeared in lots of your work. Mm. Um, so I'm interested in in that. Did you ever have a different version of what the experience would be that you would be? She had a lot big boobs when we started, <laughs> but the, and it was very strange. <laughs> but the, the user was always going to be that woman. She was never going. To, you were never just going to stand. She off was on the never going to be a man, or, right? Um, and that that's uh, just what I'm like. Yeah. Uh, she was always going to be a woman, and and women are implicated as much as anyone. And I think the the thing too is that this is a when you wreak havoc, it's it's um, inadvertent to some degree. And sometimes that was you know women um, often came with the men, yep. uh, the colonials, and that was inadvertent as well. Yeah. Uh, but you know she, you know I wanted someone to be that, to be the colonial. I wanted them to, to be, to see themselves, and reflect on that, and reflect on what they were doing. Yeah. So once you first go into the work, you see yourself in the mirror. So it's very clear right at the start that that's the person that you are playing while you're, or not playing, but mm. acting as in, mm. in the work. Um, I think we have some footage of. Should we play the footage, Josh, that you provided? The hand, the, if you yeah. like. I've yeah. Got, uh, the hand, the leap motion stuff if you want to Do show we have that probably towards the to end run? of it where the hands so it's early test right video yeah we're experimenting with the the yeah setup yeah yeah just pretty much the mirror was one of the first things well was the first thing that we put in in experimenting with the character i think one <laughs> thing <laughs> the purple grass <laughs> yeah. the um i mean making it it's not often in vr that you have an i that you have an identity at all um, quite yeah, often exactly. it's like a, you're there in this playground world where you can interact with everything, mm -hmm. but it's kind of a conceit of that particular way of being in there that you are like a disconnected observer who can influence the world, but you don't have, they're not placing you in. Whereas a lot of storytelling um, done through first person computer games puts a lot of effort into trying to make you feel like a certain character right? Um, and giving you a body and making that body be influenced by the environment so that you have some sort of connection to it. But in VR, not so much. So I think, think it was, um, you know, one point of departure to have a VR experience where you are actually someone and it's a very particular person that you, are, that you embody. Yeah. Uh, and then also, um, you know, it made sense. For the, out of things like the Banksia spray paints, yeah. uh, the claiming of things mm. for the for the protagonist to be a and also female. for people watching this, um, this is just a very early work in progress. <laughs> so the work looks completely different from that now, oh, and also so much this water might be making people feel a little bit seasick because it's first person camera. But when you're actually in the work, the world is very stable. Mm. And your movement is very kind of intuitive, and so you have none of that motion sickness because the world is not moving around you like that. Well, you're actually, also at the moment, you see how her head is tilted forward. Yeah. So what happened was that so the leap motion is a uh, is something that goes onto the headset, and you don't need hand controls. With right, right. Um, but what I felt once you you know it was lovely on one level, but. She, but the, the way it made you look down, so you had to constantly be looking down, and I felt like that took away from the fact that you were in a big expanse and that right. there was a lot to enjoy mm. in yeah. the environment. Um, it wasn't an, a, a completely easy decision um, yeah. because it was so nice to be using your hands freely. Right. Um, but, you know, maybe another time. Yeah. Um, maybe we can show the security camera footage as well. Because that's another element that's in this work. Oh, there's just a picture there oh. of the installation. <clears throat> so in the bottom left, you can see somebody using the work. And in the top, there's a little desk that's just outside the kind of play area, which you've set up as like a, a desk of an absent security guard. And what's showing on the monitors there? So what you, what's oh, showing on yeah. the monitors is... Footage from inside. This one's footage from various parts of the the virtual reality world. Um, and on the other camera is actual. There's a on one of the ferns. There's a security camera, right. and so it's actually live footage of what that person is doing. 
in the VR. Right. And the um, security camera image is something you've used in quite a lot of your other yeah, works. Yeah, in most of my works, there's security cameras because we're always being watched. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, and it's just... I mean, there's more to that. Yeah. But it's... Uh, and also, you know, security camera on a fern, you know, in the natural world, it's, it's you know, it's mm. a bit wrong. Mm. Um, and this also shows us a few of the things um, that people can do within the world. Maybe you could talk a little bit about what, when you set up the original kind of area where the user stands. There's a whole lot of different elements, like as we've seen, you can catch butterflies, um, you can throw things on the barbecue. There's also a chest of drawers with a whole lot of drawers in it. Um, there's a river with fish that you can try to catch. What, how, how did you come across that sort of list of activities? Did it just kind of grow organically from I just thinking never about stopped it? writing lists. Right. And we'll, I mean, there's some things that aren't, that you can do that aren't, you know, directly causing havoc, but there's quite a few things that you do that do. Um, but there's also other aspects to things. For example, we have the Polaroid camera. So you take a photo of the Polaroid, you can actually see the picture you've just taken coming out. Yep. Um, but that is actually then the photos appear from a printer in the room. Right. So I love the crossover from the virtual reality yeah. to the actual reality. It's kind of like magic. You do it's get to walk away with a picture in your hands that you took in virtual reality. You can see the lady with the yeah. early But I mean, look, becoming. lots and lots of things are going on the whole time. You know, for ages we had a, a, a small digital camera and it and the longer that we tested it, the more we knew it didn't make sense. Right. Um, that we needed some other type of yeah. um, camera. Yeah. Uh, and, and some of these decisions are based on what you can actually get as a 3D object that's in a low enough polygons to actually use. Yeah. Uh, because, you know, a lot of the VR objects that you can uh, buy are not uh, going to be used in this t type of way. Yeah. Um, so we can just see here some sort of st static footage from within the world. Um, and there's a pokey machine there. What, how did that end up in, in this landscape? Well, there, you know, you need one. <laughs> <laughs> oh, shall we put a pokey machine in there? Oh, yeah. <laughs> but, you know, we were constantly running through what we could put in, what could happen, yep. um, watching people play with things in tests, yeah. uh, you know, seeing what actually, you know, was effective. Yeah. Uh, and again, you have things like there's a phone in the drawer and when you answer the phone, it start, it's, it's a recording that we had a voiceover from um, England do a recording of some of what contentious diaries from mm -hmm. 1788. And the first thing that you hear on the phone is something like, the, the natives were found labouring with the smallpox. Right. Uh, we expected them to be um, aggressive, but they were actually, you know, very warm and welcoming. Yeah. Just things like that, just, you know, they're, they're subtle or not so subtle, but they, you know, they could shift away someone thinks, having never heard something like that before. Yeah. All the draw labels um, are handwritten by me with an ink pen, um, and they're also excerpts from what contentious diaries. And um, there are many things you can do in the world, but there's no, um, it's not like a linear process, is it? It's not like in a game where you do one step after another. Well, it's you not like in a video animation where you can control people. Yes. So <laughs> um, what maybe you could talk about, like, for you as an artist, the positives and the negatives of just kind of having this sort of open-ended, let's call it an, a narrative environment where people can interact with the world but you don't actually get to control the order in which they I know things. it's really frustrating sometimes <laughs> uh, because you know as Josh will attest when people are in it I'm saying go for the draws <laughs> no top third draw <laughs> <laughs> and it's hard when they've only got a certain time limit if they're a shy person or they've never been in a game before they may not be uh, bold enough to go and just try everything a l well, most things are interactable with yep. in, in some way. Yeah. 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 And um, what, 
once you kind of established some of the ideas of what you wanted to happen in the world or the range of possibilities, how did you two work together to actually make them work? Sometimes better than others. <laughs> <laughs> did you have a lot of input, Josh, into the, the nature of the interactivity or the kind of the sensation of how people physically move around the world or...? Um, yeah, I, mean, I think the way that we discussed what was possible and what could be put in there was already sort of couched. There was already, um, you know, I, I can't think of the top of my head something that you suggested that would have been a total nightmare to try and put in there. But he would tell me. Right. And we would work... But, you know, if it was up to me, those rabbits would be, like, four times as big. Right. And there would probably be four times as many. Right, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, but apparently it's not Alice in Wonderland. No. I don't know. <laughs> We did have... I mean, you know, there's, there were times when I insisted on things, like very vehemently insisted, and there were times when Josh pulled me back from things and also pulled me back from, like, what, what's the point in doing that because, you know, this is, this is what we're basing it on. This is the... You know, we, have, we, we had a clear understanding of what the work was about. Right. So, um, you know, you could get a bit silly with it. And, and you know, he was completely on my page with, you know, understanding what it, what it was going to do. Yeah. Um, but you will always get, you know, people having dis different ideas right. about right. how that could be. I remember talking to you while you were making it and talking about how long the experience would be and you were trying to work out whether you should just let people stay in there as long as they liked or... And you said you thought the average time would be around about five minutes. Mm. But in the end, you've put a, an end to the time at, eight, at seven or eight minutes. The work kind of comes to a natural end, doesn't mm. it? But I guess it could have been eternal or... Um, well, I mean, people could easily stay in there for 20 minutes if yeah. they actually uh, interact with everything. everything if they yeah. went into all the drawers, um, yeah. they listened yeah. and they... Yeah, they could easily be in there for a lot longer. Yeah. And people, some people just like being in there. I mean, look at it. It's beautiful. Yeah, it is really beautiful. Um, and it's great watching it's people holiday. interact with the work because they're discovering things and you hear them go, oh, oh, oh. <laughs> and it's really fun to do things, but it is quite conflicting because you'll reach up on top of the chest of jaws and touch the kind of glass dome and suddenly you've released the rabbits and you realise that you've that's a rabbit plague and there's nothing you can do to stop that. You can't put them back. Well, you can't put them back, but also you often want to touch them and every time you touch them, they reproduce. Yeah. So... Yeah. So the work is really clever in the way that it does make you want to keep touching things and poking at things and trying to interact with things, even as intellectually you realise that you're causing damage. It is quite a conflicting experience. Mm. And I think that's the real power of this work, the way you've captured that in such an, uh, a kind of accessible and sort of intuitive way. You don't have to get a lecture while you're doing it. It all becomes blind. Unless I'm in the room. <laughs> <laughs> really <laughs> evident. Yeah. Yeah, it's good that it's, yeah, that it's worked out like that because, of course, it's an experiment. Yeah. Um, yeah. And um, is it an experiment you'd like to continue exploring? Do you want to have a think about doing more in VR or are you going to step back into 2D I, video? Or? Uh, the way I am um, is that I just need a, a rest. Yep. And once I have a rest, then I can, I can work that out. I've got actually no idea at the moment. Right. I mean, I'm still messaging Josh after a, uh, in the morning and saying, hey, I just had a great idea. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, we'll probably be tweaking it for a little while. <laughs> we do have the a little bit of a get out of jail free card with this particular work in that it's based on um it's based on set of expectations of normal vr the audience has with normal vr mm. so mm. like it's kind of like a trick work in that mm. sense that it's designed to sort of take it to co-opt the way th that people will just run around interacting with it. Mm. So to make we couldn't really make another one like this because it's no. the trick. No, the that's trick has right. come out of the right. of the box. Yeah. yeah, but see there you've got the you can look through the viewer and you can see um, explosions and and a mine appear. Yeah. You've, you've got it's real footage in 
existing yeah. film footage that you've put yeah. in. Yeah, and you can blow mountains up, you can mm. throw grenades and grow buildings, mm. and you can graffiti, you can spray paint, you can put lipstick on. Yes, the more you do these, more factories appear dotted around the landscape, and yeah, it's pretty. And all the trees fall over at some point, which is. Yeah, people knock the trees over to for cows. Yeah. It's great. <laughs> And the cow sounds get so obnoxious, you just want to get out of there. <laughs> what have you done? <laughs> um, at this point, maybe we'll see if anyone in the audience has any questions for you. Do we have any questions from our audience tonight? Um, Joan, you mentioned that it was never going to be, the, the character that one adopts was never going to be a man. Could you elaborate on, on that a bit? Why not a man? Because that's just the most obvious thing, isn't it? I mean, to be honest, it's, it's just, you know, we're often looking at um, people in positions of power or, you know, um, causature <laughs> to yeah. be men. Yeah. Uh, and I, I mean, I've used women most of the time. Often the men are set to the side and so, it is. It's a. It's a combination of two things. One, my own personality, and and two, just wanting to take, you know, what I see is that colonial superiority, just, um, just from a, a different angle. She very much has an air of privilege, doesn't she, about her? No, oh, she's so privileged. And when you look down, when you're in the VR, you see this massive yellow dress that you're wearing, and you almost have the sense of it makes you move in a different way. So mm. you do really have the sense of being in outside of your everyday kind of experience. Yeah, I mean, it also gives you that sense of being in the Australian <coughs> landscape with this crazy with this crazy clothing that's just yeah. alien and wrong, yeah. uh, to be honest. And, yeah. you know, it, 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 the dress is cumbersome, it gets in your way, yeah. um, and that is also part of it, for you to feel that type of, you know, uh, lack of connection to nature, yeah. which is actually what the basis of all my work is about, really. Yeah. Okay. We have another question. I haven't seen the work before. It's really cool. I feel really connected to it because of the nature. Um, and I had a rabbit like that, <laughs> exactly, <laughs> growing up. So it's really freaky. Um, is that a mirror or on the tree? Yeah, that's a mirror. Oh, cool. And um, is that your projection out at Fed Square of the water? Is that one of your works? There's a screen outside at night that's got water running through uh, it? I don't know. I no, don't, don't think so. I don't think so. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and also on a practical level, um, what program did you use to create the work? Uh, so I used Unity 3D, um, which is, yeah, as Fiona said, it's a tool that can be used for making games they're starting to use it for um, for cinema as well now, to composite in um, CGI elements and build some bits and pieces in there. It's um, very easy to quickly um, start experimenting with it, but it's also powerful enough to to um, get some really good results once you've done the experimenting. So it's really nice, and it's also free if people want to. Um, Unity is great for developing in VR or AR because it supports a bunch of different platforms. So you can um, very quickly sort of start to experiment with it as a complete beginner. Lots of YouTube videos talking about how to use it. And then it supports um, building what you've made out to Google Cardboard. So like the cheapest possible way that you can get VR with your phone in a little um, holder or um, the... Um, Samsung Galaxy VR thing mm -hmm. that I, his name I've com completely forgotten or Oculus Rift or Vive or and you know we can anticipate that whatever next generation of VR AR bits and pieces come out Unity will Im implement support for it as well so if you start experimenting um, I am a big advocate actually for people um, more and more people just to experiment with it whether regardless of what their background is, just to start playing because it's fun to play, to start building things in in 3D, uh, and not too hard. How do you put? Um, I'm doing dance at Deakin Uni. Mm -hmm. um, how do you put a real person in there? 
So there's some really fun things that you can do. Like obviously you can go to a full on motion capture rig uh, and you know get really you know twenty points, thirty points of uh, of uh, articulation and bring that in. If they would, if you really, if you wanted that sort of professional um, cleaned up quality of motion capture, you'd go to to one of those rigs and then they'd give you an animation file that you could just then stick into into whatever 3D software you had. You can also download things for free. There's libraries and packages of, um, of pre-made animations that you can get, or something that is really fun to experiment with is using, so actually we do it in real time for this work um, because we kind of do motion capture in real time for this because all of the people who are in there using the two controllers and the headset, when you see them from the security camera view, they're this articulated colonial lady. And what that's doing is taking those three points that it knows about, the headset position and the rotation and the two controllers, and just trying to figure out a realistic humanoid body position for that. And I've done that. Um, one of the other artists that I worked with, John A. Douglas, has a, a body performance practice. And we've uh, used that for doing real-time motion capture. And it's you don't have to pay for it. You have the Vive headset, you've mm. got the controllers, mm. and you can get pretty reasonable motion capture. If you want to improve it, I have two trackers that go on the feet that add a little bit more detail to it. You can add as many as you want, basically, to that. Um, we've actually found that um, theatre companies and dance companies are quite interested in working with VR. And they have such a different sense of being in a space mm. than filmmakers do because filmmakers are always like, where do I put the camera? Where do I, how do I cut? You know, it's quite interesting that dance companies and theatre companies are really, oh, this is amazing. We can put the person in the space because they're used to working, thinking spatially. But that wasn't a problem for you, Joan, thinking about this work. You just kind of felt really comfortable having the character, being the kind of character in the space. You weren't thinking about how do I, do I cut to a close up or that wasn't really an issue with this work, was it? No, but I, again, I think it's, you know, just trying to, to make an artwork within it. It's yep. like, just just start with one idea. Yep. Um, and, and things about the body in space can come up later if, it's, uh, yeah. if it becomes an issue, yeah. if it's not what you want to happen. Yeah. yeah. And I guess I'm coming from that animation background as well. Yeah. I guess yeah. you can make anything happen in animation. But I mean, it, it is interesting about artists and you know, people from other disciplines coming in to, to use it because, again, as you said, once you get artists in, they start wanting to do weird things that no one's thought about before. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and that's, you know, why we did this, to, yeah. to see where we could push it. Yeah. 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 Um, well, if we have any other questions, if not, we might finish up for tonight. Um, so... Thank you very much, Joan and Josh, for talking with us about your work. And it's on at ACME until the 31st of March, so please come along and experience it for yourself. Thank you very much. Thanks, Fiona. Thanks, Fiona.